Let's and shift our some focus. Some people know a lot about what's going on. Yeah, go ahead. to AI. Um, cause obviously that's, that's your next big challenge that you're, you're taking on right now. Um, and it's, I've got actually a number of different, uh, you know what, I'll go with, I'll go with one of the ones from our audience. Um, I've got any kind of an adder to this one. Charles asks, AI is set to disrupt the global economy in ways that we've never experienced before. Uh, not in our lifetimes, maybe never ever as a species. Uh, what do you see as your role? in guiding an economic future that includes AI. And then my follow on here is as a key contributor potentially to this upcoming change, do you feel a personal responsibility for shepherding AI in a responsible direction? Or do you kind of go, well, look, that's the software guy's problem. I just build, I just build the, the platform that it rides on. Like wh what's going on here in your mind? Well, if you're an historian, you know, the human race has been radically disrupted, you know, a dozen times in the last couple hundred years. You know, automation is kind of wild. Uh, my father used to tell me it was the fractional horsepower motor that automated all the factories. You know, electricity generation was huge. Obviously, you know, everybody talks about the printing press, books, being able to read, college educations, highway system. It's It's... It's a lot, right? And then Kurzweil says, except, you know, progress accelerates. And so it's one thing for something to happen like once a generation, but we've gone through mainframe, mini computer, workstation, PC, mobile, internet. Internet, yeah. You know, cloud computing, you know, always on, always connected. And a lot of that's in my AI. lifetime, man. Like, yeah, what yeah. is going so this on? Is, this is a lot of accelerations in one place, right? Now, I'm a technologist. I know how to build computers. And we, like, my part of it is I, I really don't think the world would be a good place if only the, the super rich corporations had big computers. Right? I think AI technology should be available to as many people as possible, that the software should be as open as possible. I really. I really like the fact that some people are publishing really good AI models. We decided to publish our compiler stack. As you know, like the core of the TPU compiler and NVIDIA stuff is proprietary and not accessible to, to everybody. Um, in terms of managing society, I, I don't believe individuals are the right answer to that. I think this is a collective effort, which needs a lot of people to think about it. Also, but on the flip side, in most of the transitions we've ever had, the doomsayers have been wrong. Right? We keep solving the, you know, how does society and people and individuals work together to solve our technology problems and the balance of power between all the factions. You know, so I, you know, I have some concern about it. I have a belief in human progress. I think. I, I, I like the open source world. I like open technology. I like products that people can build and afford. I'm not really into the one trillion dollar computers that only two people can afford. You know, so my tends towards mission is partly I like how do we make computers cheaper and how do we make them more open? And <clears throat> when we're licensing our technology to a bunch of people to build their own products. And you know, I think that's that's part of the democratization I'd say of of AI and software in general, which, which I'm a fan of. So. so tell me this. I mean, AI is clearly, it's in, that, it's in that stage right now. It's like it's like it's a toddler, right? Like it'll do something one day that impresses the hell out of you. And then it'll be, you know, running to greet you when you come home and it'll trip and nail its face on the floor and it's got a big nosebleed, you know, the, the five minutes later, right? Like it's, it, it's clearly stumbling around looking for its footing, but you see the potential, right? You see what this thing's going to grow up into. How harmful do you feel like high visibility AI fails are? 
Um, the humane pin, for example, is something that we're going to be talking about later on in the show, has generated a ton of mainstream buzz. And I mean, that's that's obviously there's some recency bias there that makes me bring up that versus, uh, you know, talking about some of the um, OK, like the 30 million dollar heist that was facilitated by uh, machine learning powered uh, deep fakes. Um, there's clearly a lot of a lot of FUD around AI. And do you think that sort of damages our progress in the long term or is it all just a blip? Yeah, it's all a blip. Like AI has already been through several hype cycles. It's going to go through more hype cycles. You know, the, the history is usually the big first movers don't become incumbents. Like nobody heard of Google and Facebook and Amazon before they became big. You know, it was IBM, Digital Equipment, Sun Microsystems, they're all gone. So, like, there's going to be multiple blips. There's going to be, you know, both funny and, you know, somewhat scary, you know, issues. But it's, you know, the human race is pretty big and resilient and there's lots and lots of smart people. And, um, yeah, well, it's going to elaborate out all over the place. You know, it's, it's happening as we speak. No, am, am I worried about it? I am definitely curious. It's going to be a it's going to be a wild ride. Okay, you you, know, you did it like again. The last twenty five years have been wild. Yeah. You, you actually did it again. Are you sure we're not in a simulation? <laughs> because the next nope. thing I was going to ask is <laughs> well, no, no. Here's here's the really funny part. Okay, so, here we go. Like, it, if you were going to build a simulation, you would build in a bunch of things that like let's say limit the computation you need. Like the speed of light's cool because you can't really see what's going on over there because there's a limit that you, like things don't interact all at once. And the uncertainty <laughs> principle is really cool because when you look at something really closely, it gets a little bit undefined. Like we live in a, here's my favorite part of the universe. We live in a universe that's governed by three principles, the uncertainty principle, the incompleteness theory, and the un, unprovability problem. <laughs> so it's uncertain, incomplete, and unprovable. <laughs> if you were building a simulation, those would be some pretty good rules to put into it because that would massively limit the amount of computation you have to do. Okay, so let me jump That's in fine. with yeah. what was going to be my next question from Ricky. Um, like you said, hey, it turns out AI, pretty hard. Driving a car, pretty hard. I mean, uh, Mr. Musk mm -hmm. has famously promised us that full autonomous driving is... X amount of time away. Um, I, I, I kind of am wondering if he had a, an early point in his career where he worked at Valve at this point when it comes to giving ETAs for things. Um, and, I, and Ricky wanted me to ask you, okay, how far are we really away from full self-driving? Because I got to tell you, I am relatively speaking an idiot. But when we got the promise that, you know, full self-driving was going <laughs> to be... Can you drive a car? I can. Well, okay. Oh, so you you can. <laughs> At least so I'm smarter than your cars, computer. So it doesn't seem like like we don't really need AGI to drive cars. It turns out because okay, yeah, so it's pretty funny. What I was trying to say is. <laughs> Relatively speaking, I'm an idiot, but I looked at the claim that, you know, every current, every current Tesla was going to be capable of full autonomous driving. And I went, there's no way. There's no way. Even knowing what I know, it's just there's absolutely no way that they have the kind of capabilities, even if I extrapolate, even if Tesla is, is 10x what everyone else is doing on the market right now. I just, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Um... So how so so Ricky asks me to ask, how far are we away from true, like level four, level five, true full self driving? Give me give me yeah, a spitball. So, so well, my favorite my favorite crack about Elon is he turns the impossible into late, and then people complain about it like crazy. <laughs> 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 and I always thought that that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Got to raise money somehow. It, <laughs> Yeah, well, sure. You know, kick the can down the road, build some products. Like, their cars are great. I, I have two of them. So, and I like full self-driving. I use it every day. And uh, it's a little quirky. Um, but it's getting better. <laughs> no. Uh, so, there's building a big enough AI engine. So, 
So humans drive cars really well. I taught both of my daughters in you know a couple hours to drive a car, and it turns out they both have a general intelligence, right? And so for them, congratulations, is a subset of that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It's pretty good. And I, <laughs> I, I was thinking of A/B testing them, like, like I was going to have one of them like read the rules and then you know go for a drive, and then I was going to have the other one watch like a hundred million hours of video, and then <laughs> see which one could drive faster, but. My daughter, Catherine, she told me to bug off. <laughs> She's like, no way I'm watching. Like 100 million hours of video to learn to drive a car, Dad. Like, she learned it like eight minutes flat. Like, so the, the general intelligence seems to be a really good thing. Now, the problem in the cars today is we're trying to put a small AI engine there and get the maximum performance out of it. Yeah. So Waymo, I'm in San Francisco right now. They drive around with no drivers in the car, it's pretty spooky. And, you know, that's a fairly heavy-handed solution because it's got a shitload it's of sensors. Sensors everywhere, you know, yeah. Mos it's mosquitoes wild. and all that stuff. Whereas Elon would say, like, a one-eyed guy with 2200 vision could drive a car and, you know, you don't have to be that smart. Now, that, <laughs> that causes the trade-off because yeah. the smaller the computer, the better the software has to be. So I think if you put... I don't know, five petaflops in a car with some of the new good transformer models, you could drive a car pretty fast. But there's another weird thing, which is humans aren't data intelligence, we're computationally intelligent. Like, you didn't get smart by watching hundreds of, you know, millions of hours of anything. Don't, don't like tell my audience that. that when you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you watched hundreds of hours in the last week, but it's only you know, tens of thousands of hours. It's not that much information. Like, we get some information, we essentially learn to simulate the world. So, you, you know, I don't know if we live in a simulation, but our brain sure is a simulation. And we haven't, we haven't really cracked the AI problem of building really smart systems that, like, simulate themselves and essentially create intelligence with simulation. They, they're creating intelligence with data prediction, uh, which seems pretty smart, but it doesn't seem like it's not close to what we actually do. I want to and loop back around. It's like, yeah, that, well, people get a lot of data from, from vision, but blind people are smart too. Like you don't, you don't need to see anything to be smart. And that's I not wanna, data at all. I want to loop back around to one of my earlier questions. And this is obviously going to be a little bit of uh, mm -hmm. crystal ball gazing, and I don't expect you to have a good answer for it. But I, you know, I asked, okay, how much of a generational improvement is we just didn't think of that versus we just didn't have the capability. Right now, you're really focused on AI. You're focused on risk five. That's, that much is very obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to imagine for someone like you, talking to the people you do talk to, you got to have some idea of what the next thing is. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Jensen had some idea where he was going with CUDA while everyone else was sitting there going, why don't I just have more FPS on my stupid gaming thing, right? You know, what, is there a risk five replacement that is, that is you know, two, two cells dividing right now? Um, where are we going? Well, let, let's say it a different way. So, so your brain, you know, there's, there's this theory about you had a primitive brain, then a motor cortex, and then an emotional brain, and then you know, cerebral cortex. So our brain evolved to add layers. Like our cerebral cortex is essentially a high-end planning machine. And so obviously animals survived just fine without one. And then when it started to grow, you have to ask, like, what was it for? And it could be it helped model the world better and, and create better planning with better outcomes. And at some point, the uh, cerebral cortex took over. Most people think they live there in their head. So you could do things really fast with direct connections through your motor cortex. But most of the you that you believe is you, if you believe in that kind of thing, seems to be your thought press in your higher level thinking. So today, AI computers are treated as accelerators to general purpose computation. That's going to flip pretty soon. AI computers are, are going to treat general purpose computers like a motor cortex. So there'll be AI things running to do stuff, and occasionally they'll say, generate a deterministic program to do something, right? As opposed to deterministic programs calling up AI modules. So that flip is coming pretty fast. 
And Interesting. the way we think about programming, like you were talking about, well, how are we going to run the old games? None of that's yeah. going to exist. Like, and even stuff as simple as video is going to be all generated. Like, nobody's in 10 years going to watch a movie. Like, you're going to live in a movie. Right? It's going to be all real-time generated. And you're going to interact with it. And you're going to ask your favorite character, what the hell's going on? They're going, shut up, I'm shooting somebody. <laughs> like, this, like, like, this is going to happen faster than you think. And... Like, so all the mediums we think about are toast, and all the software that's ever been written is going to be gone, like 100%. I mean, obviously, there's going to be a ton Pretty of resistance fast. to I this. I mean, there'll be a corner, there'll be a guy with a rotary phone and, a, and an iPhone and a, a Java program or something, but it, w it won't be material to your everyday life. So... Okay, I guess I'm about to ask you to, and feel free to ignore this question if you're just like, look, I don't need the uh, well, I don't I need the hate mail. One more if you want it. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer in um, we're going like, like we're going to use AI to rethink a lot of science. And, right. Uh, so human beings, like we have this idea of like, you get the idea of a theory, you have a prediction. The problem is <clears throat> you get trapped in your theories. And so then new data comes along, and you can't really in interpret it into your theories. So all our science is, is, you know, it's elaborated from a bunch of ideas, but they're all human ideas, and they can't encompass, comp encompass all the data. And, okay. and I think science is going to go through a fairly big revolution. I'm still going to see if I can get a hot Good. take out of you. Yeah. Um, when okay, you cool. see, for example, you see the, uh, I think you've, you've brought up entertainment a couple times. You brought up gaming, you brought up film. Uh, when you see, for example, the actors union, uh, negotiating to keep generative AI out of film and music, out of art, uh, you know, what's your, what's your take on that? This has happened a lot. You know, there was a big split, of, you know, supposedly in Europe, I read it in the history books that, you know, Austria banned, like, knitting machine, you know, weaving machines and, and clothing mills and all that stuff because they didn't want the people to lose all their jobs. And England embraced it and, you know, one won and one lost. So, yeah, so the writers' unions will say, you can't use this for this movie. And it'll create a whole new area where they don't exist and people will generate all kinds of stuff. And, and so technology change usually means you you get on you get on board you get left behind. You know now I think there'll still be writers there'll still be books there'll still be movies made by people for people. There's all kinds of stuff like that. Like you you can buy machine made clothing but people buy knitted clothing. People people like what people do. And you know that's a really great thing. You know, we, we like artists, like, you can get a perfect painting by somebody printed, but you still buy the painting from the artist that you talk to, because it's at some level more interesting. But yeah, keeping AI out of this and that and the other thing is going to be a hard fail.